Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. And every week, I invite a speaker to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and their photography expertise. You can find the schedule for our upcoming presentations on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to previous sessions on my YouTube channel. Erin Randall is here tonight helping me behind the scenes. Say hello, Miss Erin. Hello, Miss Erin. <laughs> and I'm also very bummed that you are not letting me tell jokes anymore. Uh, you'll, get, you'll, get about over, that. you'll get over it. I'm still recovering from that last one. Um, my guest tonight is Tom Snitzer. Tom has been capturing images for over four decades. His work spans several genres, including sports, nature, theatrical, and corporate photography. Along the way, Tom has been educating students to help them reach their creative potential, both in the classroom and out in the field. In tonight's presentation, Becoming an HDR Ninja, Tom will break down the steps to creating quality, high, dynam high dynamic range images by using HDR software and graduated filters to exposure blending, he'll cover all the tricks that the pros use to create the world's most dramatic images. Tom has provided a handout for his presentation, so if you haven't already downloaded it, you'll find a link to it at lindanickel.com backslash schedule under the description for Tom's presentation. So with that, Tom Snitzer, welcome to the Happiness Hour. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, I am excited to be talking to you all tonight. Uh, about a subject, by the way, I obviously I love photography. I've been doing it for a long time, but I have, uh, I guess I find each year I get more excited about it. And uh, in addition to being very lucky um, that I've been able to shoot in a variety of genres, everything from nature photography to uh, shooting automotive stuff for the Chicago Tribune and sports. Um, one of the things I really enjoy is education. And what's ironic is the whole idea for tonight's presentation, believe it or not, uh, came from a group of my high school students. And uh, one day we're sitting in class and uh, a number of them said, hey, Mr. Snitzer, we're having a really tough time with our unicorn shots. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, you're probably wondering what a unicorn shot is because I was. I am. So what yeah. I'd, I would like, I'd like all of you right now to think about a place that you have always dreamed about going to, that you've never been on your bucket list, okay? Everybody just take a second, think about some amazing place that you wanna go, okay? My case, um, just to use an example, maybe you've always wanted to go to the coast of Spain. So I wanna picture you get up early, you know, um, the crack of dawn, the sun is breaking over the ocean, a bright orange sky, um, and it's reflecting over these beautiful villas along the water and the boats, and the most amazing scene you've ever, you know, you've ever looked at, and you get back and your pictures don't come out. Every, all the colors gone, everything's overexposed. That is what I call or what they refer to as losing a unicorn shot. So very simply, when we get off this um, Zoom session tonight, it is my uh, goal that not one single person will ever use, lose another unicorn shot. So that's what we're here to discuss, okay? And uh, and I've helped uh, hundreds of people do this, so I'm confident I can help you. Um, that said, um, you know, when you use the word unicorn shot, what I'm really talking about is shooting um, in difficult light, okay? And uh, difficult light is oftentimes when we talk about high dynamic range. Okay. So, so first of all, the, the best way I know to uh, talk about HDR, uh, and it's an experience we've all shared is, you know, you've, I assume all of you have been to the beach at night and you may be talking to your friends and it's easy for you to see your friends and to take advantage and look at the sunset. But if you try to take a picture, inevitably you're gonna get something like this where the people in the picture are in silhouette. And the reason for that is that the camera that you're using sees the world very differently than you can. Most of the people viewing um, me tonight are capable of seeing 20 stops of dynamic range. And that means that you can see basically between the darkest and lightest areas of the picture, which is really the definition of dynamic range, you can see something that's 500,000 times brighter 
than the darkest area of a picture. And cameras can't even come close to that. So what we're really gonna be talking about tonight are the tools um, so we can begin to approach the world the way uh, through a camera lens, the way we see it through our own eyes, okay? Now I wanna just digress here for a second, a couple of quick things. One, as Linda mentioned uh, when we start out, um, it's really important that I don't lose anybody as we're going along here. And we're going through a lot of material. If you have any questions or something I say doesn't make sense to you, um, feel free to ask a question. You can either unmute yourself or ask it in the text, but I have absolutely no problem. I wanna answer questions. And if you don't understand something, I screwed up because I should make things crystal clear. Number two, um, I realize that we have people, um, some of you have been shooting for years and we have you know, high degrees of expertise. Maybe some of you are uh, a little newer to the game and have a high learning curve. So I'm gonna be trying to do a little something for everyone. I'm gonna have some basic material I go over and I'm gonna have a few things that I'm gonna throw in for our more advanced shooters. And I'm gonna try to explain it in a way um, that our more novice shooters can aspire to later and try to decomplicate it, okay? Um, so hopefully before um, I, I start out here, I hope no one has any questions at this point. Um, uh, good. So what I'm gonna do, I'd like to just give you a real quick outline of what I'm gonna go over tonight so you know where I'm driving the bus. Uh, typically when I talk about HDR, people are you know, rightfully excited to hear about HDR software. And we're gonna go over that. We're gonna go over which different types of software are available, which ones I like best, the workflow, all that good stuff. However, um, I view HDR software and photography as almost like a nuclear warhead. It's very powerful, but there are conventional weapons that we have at our disposal in the photography um, that I may point you to first, okay? So some of the things we're gonna talk about in the order, number one, um, the difference between shooting raw uh, and JPEG, um, does ISO make a difference in terms of the dynamic range you can capture? Uh, how about the camera you're using? Is it important? Does it matter what kind of camera you're shooting with? Um, how important is it whether you're underexposing a picture or perhaps overexposing a picture? Does that matter? Um, and once we've talked about that, you know, how difficult is it to get the exposure right? Does it even matter? Um, we're also going to talk about can you save a picture in post-processing, for example, in Lightroom? How much latitude do you have to save a good picture that looks like it's wiped out. And then we're gonna get into some more advanced tools like what are called graduated neutral density filters, a technique in Photoshop called exposure blending, and then we're gonna finish up with HDR software. So we've got a lot of good stuff to go over tonight. And uh, without any further ado, unless anyone again has any questions, I'm gonna dive right in. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I have a quick drink of water here. And we allow that here. I'm going to wet my whistle. Thank you. I may do it frequently. Um, okay. okay. Um, I am uh, hopeful that most of you uh, shoot in RAW, and, and in about five seconds, you're all going to be uh, deciding to shoot in RAW. When you shoot in RAW, there's some real basic, um, obvious benefits you get. One is um, you can non destructively edit pictures, you have more control and post processing. But right near the top of the list, um, is that you have more dynamic range. Um, typically, depending on the sensor and the camera you're using, you're gonna get up to like three and a half stops of more dynamic range by shooting raw. So just shooting raw gives you a real jump up on things, okay? Number two, ISO. You know, most people think of ISO as a being associated with noise. And in the old days, that was true. If you turned up the ISO, you'd get more noise. But with the new sensors, you know, give me an example. If we're shooting at an ISO of 100 and we turn up uh, the ISO to 800, the difference in noise is going to be pretty hard to, you know, pretty hard to see. It's going to be relatively modest. That is not the case with dynamic range. Depending on the camera you're using, if you turn the ISO from 100 to 800, you can lose up to like three stops of dynamic range. Okay, so I've only been talking for five minutes and I've already told you how to basically save six stops of dynamic range. Shoot in RAW and if, if all possible, shoot it in a low ISO. And for most cameras, the lowest or the native ISO is 100. A few Nikon cameras, the native ISO is 64. Okay, um, so having said that, let's move on to cameras, okay? Um, 
first of all, a, a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, um, Snits, does it matter what kind of camera it, I'm shooting with? And the answer is, yeah, it does. And actually, um, I'm going to date myself. Uh, I've actually um, been shooting for more than uh, four decades. I, most of my career, actually, I shot with film. I probably started shooting with uh, SLRs when I was about 11 or 12 years old, uh, which is like 50 years ago. So um, most of my experience is with film. And in film, we only got like six, you know, maybe seven stops at dynamic range. We had very little latitude or if we made the slightest mistake parts of the picture were all overexposed or underexposed you couldn't see them and i remember 10 years ago uh shooting with one of my first digital cameras i was shooting with a uh, uh, canon 7d and i thought i had gone to heaven because this camera had over 11 stops at dynamic range so i could capture pictures you know i could never capture before that was incredible okay what's sort of ironic is Think about everything you've experienced in the last 10 years in terms of technology, whether it's your smartphone or AI, or maybe you, you know, all the various things that have changed. Ironically, in the last 10 years, most Canon cameras still have between, you know, 11 and a half, 11.7 stops at dynamic range. They haven't changed that much, okay? However, and I'm gonna actually, by the way, I'm gonna, um, in a minute, I'm going to show you a slide here. So this is, for example, I mentioned um, before that ca uh, camera's dynamic range falls off as you turn up the uh, ISO. This is a Canon 7D. And it, like I said, it's a little over 11 stops. And as you turn up the ISO, that falls. Okay. But if you look at some of the, uh, even the newer, uh, you know, Canon cameras, the excellent 5D Mark IV, only a little bit better, about 13.5. Not bad, but um, not that much of a difference. On the other hand, if you look at even an older Nikon like the 7200, most Nikons are up at like 15 stops. So it doesn't mean that Canons aren't excellent cameras. It just means that um, you need to do things earlier to address some issues in difficult light sooner with most Canon cameras than you do with a Nikon, for example. And with the advent of the, 8, the 850 and the 810, uh, Nikon even bumped it a little higher. Um, some of you that are Sony shooters may wonder how they stack up in the, you know, the Sony mirrorless cameras are the equivalent of Nikon. Very, very good. Okay. Um, this year, however, Canon uh, sort of had an epiphany with the, uh, with the uh, advent of the new basically mirrorless R5. Um, Canon now has the first camera that has a sensor that I would say in terms of dynamic range is the equivalent of Nikon or Sony. Um, absolutely fantastic uh, camera in a lot of ways. And, uh, and by the way, for any of you that have questions about Nikon's uh, mirrorless cameras, they're also very, very good. Uh, and they are basically, um, basically up at like 15 stops. So these are cameras that aren't perfect, but they have the ability to capture a tremendous amount of dynamic range. Okay. Um, any questions come through, Linda? Are we good? Everybody yep, with me? We're good. Okay. Um, I'm going to do one quick digression here, and I'm going to show you three pictures to illustrate a point. Okay. Um, you can see if you can guess what I'm getting at here. So I'm showing these three pictures. Oftentimes people become obsessed with dynamic range. And they feel like that you have to be able to see every part of the picture. You know, every part of the picture has to be properly exposed. No, 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 no. In fact, these are these three pictures work because large parts of the picture are black and are underexposed. So I just wanna remind everybody, what I'm here today to do is to talk about giving you tools to create an image that is this, what you're dreaming up in your head. I'm not here to constrain you or tell you that you can't ever have anything in a picture that's underexposed because that's obviously false and you can see it here, okay? So having said that, um, let me just, we'll do a quick review. So raw is good, low ISO is good. And um, having a newer camera with a, a really wonderful sensor is great. But if you have an older camera, not to worry because we're gonna explain tonight how you can work around that and that's, not a problem, okay? So moving along, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about whether it's better to overexpose a picture 
or underexpose a picture, okay? Now, if there's only one thing you remember tonight, I'm about to tell you, actually, you won't be able to forget, now that I've said this, even if you wanted to forget, you won't be able to forget this. You do not want to ever overexpose a picture, okay? That's easier said than done. But even if you overexpose something by as little as a half a stop, it goes white and it's lost forever. You can't do anything to recover those details, okay? So everybody say to yourself, you know, under your breath now, I will never overexpose a picture ever again, okay? Now, um, some of the more cynical of you are saying, well, Tom, that's, that's great, but uh, you know, underexposing might be even worse. So I thought I dreamed up a really uh, ridiculous experiment to test that. So you get to uh, be the guinea pigs. So this is a picture taken <clears throat> at an ISO of 3,200. Um, and, and actually for a, for a picture where the ISO has been pushed, it's really very sharp, um, good color rendition, not too noisy. Excuse me, look I am. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you know, this looks really good. So what I'd like to examine with you is, suppose we decided to really underexpose this picture. Um, let's turn the ISO down to 100. That's five stops, okay? That's like crazy, okay? So you're probably wondering what this is going to look like, and it really looks terrific, doesn't it? This is a massively underexposed picture. You can see just a hint of sky. So my question to you is very simple. I want you to think to yourself, is there any way we could recover any part of this picture? And you're probably, if you're like me, you're going, I, I can't imagine that. I mean, the, the color is going to stink. It's going to be all noisy. It's just going to be garbage. So, um, so let's see what happens. Hey, wait a minute. Now you're wondering, Tom, you just put the old picture. What are you doing? No. I took that black picture. I took it in a Photoshop and I increased the exposure basically by five stops. And what you're seeing here, um, for those of us that make a living in photography, this is a miracle. And this is something that you couldn't do in the past. I mean, 10 years ago, what you're seeing is something called ISO invariance. The new camera sensors are so good. You can take a picture that is massively underexposed and recover all the details and, you, and it doesn't get noisy. The color's still good. That is incredible, okay? And that really for all of us has changed the game, okay? This is really, and when I say a miracle or a game changer, I'm pretty literal. What it allows us to do now is we take pictures and what we try to do is never overexpose anything and we can bring out all those details that we lost, okay? Now, some of you may be thinking, well, is that true for my camera? And the short answer is, yeah, it is true for your camera. Um, different cameras have a different amount of what we call ISO invariance. So for example, a, new, uh, a newer Sony, like a, any in the A7 line from version three on, most Nikon cameras going back four or five years, the new R5, you can recover a full five stops. They're very ISO invariant. Um, other cameras, you may only be able to you know, recover two and a half or three stops, but you can still recover a lot of stuff, okay? Um, generally speaking, Nikon sensors are more and Sony sensors are more invariant than old Canon sensors with the exception of the, uh, you know, the 5R. But um, anyway, this has really changed our approach to photography. Uh, Linda, did you have a question? I do. Angie, it just popped up. Angie wanted to know, does this, what you're talking about right now, does this apply to a crop sensor as well or just full frame? This sense? applies to both crop sensor and full frame. And what's interesting is the 7200, by the way, that I uh, put up as a crop sensor camera that has, you know, 15 stops at dynamic range, great ISO invariance. So this is not just for full frame cameras. It's a, by the way, it's a really good question. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, before I move on? No, okay. You're good. Excellent. Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm probably, it's a little hard to have everyone put their hand up, but um, uh, most people that I shoot with um, shoot in aperture priority, most of my students. And uh, as you're looking at this picture, um, the sad thing is, if you're shooting in aperture priority, it is, 
I was going to say difficult and almost impossible to take this picture if you're shooting an aperture for it. It's not completely impossible. And uh, I have some good news and bad news. Um, I'll go, I'll, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but let me explain why and what's going on here. Um, and I find this, by the way, this is something that really ticks me off about camera technology. Cameras do a terrible job of thinking intelligently about metering. And that bothers me because I think about what Apple has done with an iPhone in the last 10 years. Think about you know, all the different types of technology of self-driving cars and, this, and my stupid camera can't figure it out, okay? So um, this is a picture that I initially took in Aperture Priority. And what happens is the computer in your camera gets confused. It sees all those dark areas in the camera and it is determined to recover them. So it begins to turn up the exposure because it can't stand the black areas. And then all those beautiful um, highlit, sunlit details turn white and the camera ruins what you're trying to do. Now, I know a number of you are thinking to yourself, well, Tom, yeah, but I bracket, I'm okay. You know, I take three shots, one over, one under, that's gonna save me. Uh-uh. <laughs> Um, I'm not knocking bracketing, by the way. I think bracketing is a, can be a great tool. This picture here was taken at two and a half stops under what the light meter showed, or what my, excuse me, what it showed in aperture priority. So the sad truth is, if you want to be taking pictures in really difficult light, the bad news is you got to learn to shoot in manual. Okay. And I know a number of you are crying or like, oh my God, what a headache. I don't want to shoot manual. The good news is <coughs> I've shot hundreds of, I've taught hundreds of people to do this. And I can't think of a single person that doesn't love it. And the reason is, well, there's two reasons. Reason one <coughs> is it's pretty liberating when your pictures start turning out all of a sudden. It's a lot of fun. And number two, I'm gonna give you some techniques tonight that to make it a lot easier. <clears throat> when I'm done, some of you may be uh, saying to yourself, Tom, can I do this using aperture priority but using exposure compensation? And we'll examine the pros and cons. That's a, another way of getting to this, but using some similar tools. So we will examine that, okay? Um, so I'm going to dive in <clears throat> unless anyone has any questions. Everybody okay? We're good. Okay. So um, what I'm going to suggest is um, I'm going to give you a workflow if you have a DSLR. If you're shooting mirrorless, I'm going to give you a workflow afterwards that is ridiculously simple. It's actually easier. So we'll start with if you're shooting with a DSLR, which is probably the majority of you. So what we're going to do very simply is we're going to take a test shot. In 95% of the time, your test shot will be perfect and you're going to be all set. Okay. Um, and we're going to do a little test after that to make sure everything's okay. And every once in a while, you'll be taking maybe a second or third shot. So let me tell you what we're going to do. First step is you're going to turn your camera on manual mode. That is going to allow you to set the shutter speed and aperture manually on your camera, okay? And we're typically gonna do this in difficult light. If you've got a day where it's a little overcast, you don't have difficult light, you can keep doing what you've been doing, don't worry about it, okay? So once you turn on uh, in manual mode, you will uh, look through your viewfinder and you will see, you'll look for your light meter in your camera, okay? And uh, the way a light meter works um, is it's like a ruler inside your camera. Many of you have already used one and it tells you whether you're over or underexposed. And uh, you can see in the middle of this, there's like a little triangle above the zero. And if you're overexposed, that triangle will be over on the right. And if you're underexposed, it'll be on the left. And by adjusting the shutter speed and the aperture, you can get that thing centered in the middle. Now here's, here's my great um, innovative piece of advice. Let's pretend you're going out and you've got this you know, really beautiful sky, but it's really bright compared to all the great foreground elements. You're gonna aim your camera into the sky. The entire viewfinder, all you wanna do is fill it with sky and you're going to adjust the light meter so it's right in the middle when you're aiming on just sky. 
So you may be thinking, well, Tom, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? No, I've not lost my mind. What we are going to do is perfectly expose the sky. Okay, so the sky is not, there's nothing blown out. There's nothing overexposed. The, the foreground areas that are a little too dark, we're gonna recover those in post-processing, okay? Uh, does everyone understand that? I know this gets a little complicated if I lost anyone. Is Linda, anybody having a problem? No. Okay, so again. I don't, I don't see any yet, so. Okay, no. so I'm gonna repeat this just one more time. Turn your camera to, ca uh, to manual. Look for your light meter. Move your camera so the whole screen is just sky and adjust your shutter speed and your aperture so it's right in the center. Now you're gonna take your picture. 95% of the time you are done. Everything is perfect, okay? Um, we're going to test that, however, using a couple of diagnostic tools in your camera to make sure everything's perfect. And these are easy to use. I wanna point out, by the way, that most people that I teach to shoot manual, I liken it to learning or riding a bike. The first few times when you probably, you know, it's going back a lot of years, but when you learn to ride a bike, it was a little tricky. And after a while, you don't think about it anymore. Once you start shooting manual, you it literally, it becomes instinct and you don't think about it. Trust me, I've told hundreds of people and they all have had the same experience. So we've taken our picture. <clears throat> now in the back of our camera, we're going to look at what's called a histogram. And a histogram shows you basically the amount of the portions of your picture that are in dark tones or light tones. And the simple, and it is a diagnostic tool to help you determine if you overexposed or underexposed. And the simplest way I can tell you to think about a histogram is pro football. Think about you trying to kick the ball through the uprights, okay? The first picture uh, at the top is underexposed. And you can see that um, the, this graph or this dark area in the histogram is slammed up on the left goalpost. So that's not so good. Okay, um, if we go to the very bottom, the one at the bottom is overexposed and you can see parts of the black area are slammed up on the right histogram. The one in the middle is just right. What you're trying to do is get the histogram in the middle of the goalpost. In 95% of the time, if you've exposed in the sky, you're gonna be just fine, okay? Um, there is another tool that um, I use all the time and uh, most of my students refer to it as the blinkies, but the technical term is the exposure, the exposure warning indicator. And when you look at the back of your camera, you can turn this on in any area that's overexposed and you can see it in the left-hand part of the picture will turn black, it'll start flashing, okay? So if there's any important areas that you've overexposed that will tell you, okay? And that tells you that you gotta turn your exposure down a little bit, okay? you will find that using my technique, you will very seldom find that. Everything will normally be okay. Every once in a while, and this is for my more, sir, our more experienced advanced shooters, you may look at the histogram and you're not, you know, you're not pushing the right goalpost, but you may see it pushing on the left. You, know, you, you may think, hey, I'm losing some of the darker details in my picture. And you may say, hey, can I turn up the exposure? So for our more advanced shooters, you can. You can turn up the exposure until you start seeing blinkies coming on or it's starting to touch the right histogram. And I'm gonna take it another step further. You can even go further than that. Now I'm gonna get, again, for our more advanced shooters, a little technical. The histogram and the blinkies that you see in your camera are taken from using a JPEG image, a JPEG image. Um, we don't have cameras yet that can read raw images and actually show you diagnostics, which mean that the image that it's looking at has less dynamic range than when you get home and you look at the raw image, okay? So this is what I do when I'm trying to, like if I've got a picture with a lot of dynamic range and I wanna soak every last drop of dynamic range, I will basically turn you know, up the exposure until I'm just starting to see blinkies and from that point, I can turn it up another stop and a third or on most cameras, four clicks and not lose any details, okay? That means that when I get home, I will have no lost details. And that allows me to use, you know, I shoot Sony, so I even wanna use all 15 stops of dynamic range, 
Okay. And I realize this is really for our more advanced shooters. Um, any questions so far? I've got, this is the most difficult part of the presentation. So if you made it through this, it gets easier and easier. So don't, you know, don't get intimidated. This is tough stuff. Everybody okay? So far. Wow, I'm really, I'm really impressed guys. Well done, well played. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you a couple of tips when you're looking at a really bright red, yellow, orange sky, a, you know, AKA great, amazing sunrise or sunset, okay? If you're a new shooter, okay, what I want you to think about is little old lady or little old man, I don't wanna be sexist here. I want you to be really careful, okay? If you're shooting in that bright red or orange yellow light, I want you to be a little more conservative. This is a good time to do, if you wanna do some bracketing, go ahead and do it. Um, don't you know? push, if you see any blinkies, back it off a little bit, okay? Now I'm gonna to explain uh, to our more advanced shooters what's going on, okay? Um, most of you have, if you're an advanced shooter, sometime in the past have looked at your camera and seen two types of histogram. The main type of histogram is just a black and white histogram, a simple old black and white histogram. That's what you typically use. And most of you have seen a blue, uh, you know, uh, basically a blue, red, and green histogram. And you're wondering like, what the heck is this for? Why would you ever use this? Well, here's when, you, here's when you'd use it. If I'm shooting a bright sunrise, okay, what I will typically see is the blinkies aren't going off. My black and white histogram looks A-OK. -okay. My green histogram is great. My blue histogram is great. I look at my red histogram and it's all the way over on the right and it's, it's hitting the right goalpost and it's clipping. That's what's called clipping the red channel. And this is the difference when, when you're looking at pro shooters and you're saying, how do they get these amazing pictures, you know, in sunrise and sunset, this is how we do it. You go in and you got to make sure you don't clip your red channel. If that red channel is climbing up the right, you know, side of your goalpost, you got to turn your exposure down. And, and in these complicated situations, I will bracket, you know, because that's what you got to watch out for. It's real easy. And when you clip the red channel, what happens is you lose all the color. And this is what typically would happen with my students. They're looking at the normal diagnostic. They think they're fine. They go home. My sky's red and their sky's white. So, um, now I'm, so be conservative and careful when you're in a bright red, orange, or uh, yellow sky. Everybody got that? Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Now, um, I am on my notes, you will see links to these screens. This is Canon and Nikon, and these are the uh, screens that you need to turn on the uh, blinkies or the highlight alert or the overexposure warning indicator in your camera. So if you're like scratching your head wondering, oh my God, how do I do this? Go to my notes, easy peasy, you'll have no problem. Okay, now for, our, for those of you that are shooting mirrorless, walk in the park. Basically, when you're shooting with a mirrorless camera, you have a live view histogram and you have zebra lines. So you can do this all live view right in, right in your screen. You don't even have to take a test shot. It's you know incredibly easy. And, and when I, because I shoot mirrorless, the only, time I even worry about this stuff is if I'm shooting, you know, in bright red can, or yellow conditions, I'll check my red, blue, green histogram just to double check the picture. But with mirrorless, it's really effortless. Okay. Now I want to remind you, there are cases where, you know, the histogram, I shot this at Big Bend in Texas, and um, I didn't care if the histogram was slammed up on the left side because I wanted some of the stuff to go black. And as you can see, my histogram looks ridiculous here, but I didn't care. So again, there are cases when you're going to throw caution to the wind and let parts of your picture just go black. Okay. Okay, now, now that you've taken your picture, now it's time for, actually, I love post-processing. I don't know about you, but I, I, there's nothing more fun to me than taking a cool picture and taking it in a Lightroom or Photoshop. So I'm like a kid in a candy store. So I wanted to start off um, with a kind of a subtle picture where we're you know, going to do this with a little bit of panache and then we'll get some more extreme stuff. So <clears throat> this is a picture I took um, in, uh, I believe, Buckskin Gulch in Escalante, uh, which is in Utah. And uh, 
you know, and like I said, when you're, I exposed this picture. So the sky would, you know, I didn't want to overexpose this brilliant sky in the middle. So I'd actually walked in this cave, looked up at the sky ex exposed, came back. Okay. Now, now that you've taken the picture, that doesn't mean you're done. You got to bring out some of those darker details in the picture. Okay. So if you're new to, if you're new to this, um, but you've worked in, uh, and you can do this in a lot of programs, but like Lightroom, if you just play with the shadows slider in Lightroom, that is a real easy peasy way to bring out some of these darker details, okay? So if you're new to this, um, the first thing you do after you experiment in the field with this stuff is you go play with your shadow slider, okay? Now, in this particular case, I wanted to be, you know, a little, a little more subtle. So I'm gonna go into a little more um, sophistication here. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, I like this picture, but I would like the sky to be a little more blue. Um, there's uh, in the center of this picture, some of that rock seems like it's a little too overexposed to me. I wanna bring out a little more color. And then the area around the center of this picture, I like it to glow kind of like gold. You know, I'd like to give it a little more sheen. And the floor is a little darker than I'd like, okay? So um, what I did is I basically used um, some of the tools of selective brushes in Lightroom. And I feel, you know, you really end up feeling like Rembrandt. You can really take your picture and break it apart into areas and start playing with it, okay? So what I did using a selective brush is I first thing that I did is I went after the sky and I turned the exposure down a little bit and I lowered the color temperature a little bit, which I thought would make the sky a little bluer, not quite so bright that bright area of rock in the middle of the picture, I just reduced the exposure a little bit. And then for the floor and these, the areas around uh, the opening here, I increased the exposure and I turned up the color temperature because by calling, I turned up the color temperature, I introduced a little bit of gold. And let's take a look at our before picture. Now here's our after picture. Like I said, you know, this took me all of three minutes, but I'm able to get the picture a little more drama in this, okay? So these are easy things to do in Lightroom. If you have a rudimentary understanding of Lightroom, you can play with this stuff. If you're not used to this stuff, um, there are plenty of uh, instructional videos on how to use the adjustment brushes. And you can, like I said, the first thing to do is just play with your shadow slider, okay? Everybody good so far? We good? Okay. Now I wanna take a picture and, and go a little more extreme. So this is a picture I took uh, in Alaska, uh, I'm, I'm on my way actually to Denali and I'm driving along and I'm in a big hurry and, and I get out of that car and I underexpose this thing. I just screw the thing up royally. You know, I get home from the trip and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'm really sort of angry at myself. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, maybe I can save this, you know, this piece of garbage. Cause it, you know, this looks like just really boring, gray, bleh. So what do I do? Well, I figure uh, I start in the top part of the picture and I add some dehaze. I clank up the clarity, the clarity of the top. I use a, a graduated filter. You can use any of the adjustment brushes in Lightroom. And uh, then I add some whites to it. Okay, so I figure that using that, I'm gonna be able to bring out some zip in the top of the picture. And I look at the bottom and I'm like, oh my God, this is like, I've lost all the color. So uh, for the bottom part of this picture, what I did is I basically added uh, some saturation. I boosted the exposure, okay? And I boosted the saturation and, uh, and I actually added a little color temperature to this. Now, in terms of how I selected this area at the bottom, um, for our more novice uh, users, and I'm, again, I'm not gonna delve into a lot of complex stuff in Lightroom or Photoshop tonight, but I will tell you some places to look. So if you're a new shooter, I just use uh, an adjustment brush and paint it over the trees. Um, for our more advanced shooters, uh, Lightroom now has range masks. So what I basically did is I use a range mask. Um, I selected the color yellow and that selected automatically all the trees. And now I have a perfect mask to selectively just go after the trees. And we go from this lousy picture to holy cow. And this took me, like I said, took this took me a couple of minutes. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to illustrate, um, as long as you don't overexpose something, it is amazing what you can get 
and bringing out details, lost details and pictures. Uh, Linda, everybody still good? So far. Oh, I'm really impressed, okay. Yeah. Um, very good, I'm gonna, by the way, I'm just gonna look at my notes and make sure I haven't uh, forgotten anything important. So do you have any noise in, in these darks? Um, you know, what's interesting is with old sensors, um, you had more noise and um, you, um, as, a, as a matter of physics, you will get more noise in dark areas than light areas in a camera. And I could spend a bunch of time in that. But generally speaking, not so much. Um, you can recover a lot of details without dealing with noise issues. And these pictures have no noise reduction on them, by the way. Okay. You know, and by the way, I have all sorts of tools. I got a whole other lecture on noise reduction and different techniques, but these are like right out of the camera, nothing, no noise okay. reduction. Okay. Okay. Um, now I do, I will, um, I wanna mention one thing. Um, a number of, uh, of my students have said to me, hey, Tom, I, I, I understand shooting in manual. Hey, understand. Can I do the same thing and use exposure compensation? You know, can I, you know, uh, have it automatically do the top and uh, adjust? And the answer is you can, but you are on perilous ground. So I will tell you why I don't recommend that, but I will also admit many pros shoot this way. So there's, you know, there are differences of opinion. There are two reasons I don't like in, in, in complicated light to shoot with exposure compensation using aperture priority. Number one, I've gone out with millions of students in the field. We, we're working on a scene and they're underexposing, turn the camera off, we walk, they go off someplace else, they're, you know, and I can't remind them, hey, you turned your aperture, you know, you turned your exposure compensation on, and they go on take 30, 40 more pictures, forget that they're underexposed by two stops. Oh my God, everything, you know, didn't things didn't turn out. So that's one of the problems. It's super easy to forget. Okay. Now, here's the second reason. And it's funny, I have some, you know, friends that are, I have a real good friend that's a National Joe shooter. And we have some great arguments about this. So We'll be working, we, you know, we're, we're doing a scene. We get the exposure just perfect. I'm in manual, um, he's using exposure compensation. And I go, you know, hey, Richard, I think we got too much sky in the picture. I think we need a little more foreground. We begin to recompose. Now, it doesn't matter for me, I'm, I'm in manual. I don't have to do one thing. I can, I can zoom in, zoom out, do all sorts of stuff, change my composition. Richard though, what, he, what he's doing is he recomposes and there's less sky in the picture. And now all of his shutter speed and aperture priority stuff changes. Now he's got to start all over again. And that's why I don't like using aperture priority. When you're manual, you can mess with the picture, flip the camera right side up, vertical, horizontal, do all sorts of fun stuff. Set it, forget it. Aperture priority, uh-uh. So that's my two cents. And, and by the way, you'll find some great photographers who think I'm full of crap. So, you know, it's just one person's opinion. So, okay. Um, okay, we are now going to uh, move on to some tools. Now, every once in a blue moon, you're gonna take a picture and, you know, you've, you've made your adjustments, you've squeezed out all the dynamic range and there's still a big section of your picture that's slammed over on the left, you know. It's not very frequent, but occasionally um, you can't get it all in one shot, you know? So what do you do? Um, by the way, let me take a step back. Let me tell you when that happens um, because it's, they're, they're fairly, it's easy to tell you when this is gonna happen. When you're shooting right um, after the sun comes up in the morning and you got this like blaring bright sun coming at you, that's one of those situations you're shooting uh, a sunset and when the sun is just like, you know, blank going straight into the lens, these are situations where it's gonna be really tough, you know, if you got a really hot sun to get it in one shot. So there's a couple ways of addressing that, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go old school with you guys. Um, graduated neutral density filters have been around for decades and that's what we all use when we're shooting film and it's still a great tool. Um, and what it is, is it's a uh, tinted windshield for your camera, basically. 
So what they look like is they're typically rectangular and the top of them are shaded. And then there's like a transition area in the middle where it goes from shaded to clear. And you can get two types of these filters, really. You can get what's called a soft grad where the transition is nice and soft, or you know, you probably figured this out, you can get a hard grad where the transition is more abrupt, okay? And I typically, when I shoot, I shoot with hard grads, okay? So what you're doing is you're holding this thing in front of the lens and you're moving it so the shaded area is sitting above the darker part of the picture. And I'm gonna show you more what I'm talking about. So this is an example. Uh, this thing, you can, you can actually hold this thing and physically slide it up and down. This is a picture that was taken with a grad. And in the picture on the left, you can see that it's really kind of overexposed. And this has a, a two-stop grad. And you know the grad is being held over the sky and now the new picture looks fantastic, okay? And by the way, these grads, you can get them in one, two, three, or even four stops. Um, typically, uh, when I use grads, I use two or three stop grads. That tends to be the sweet spot. Um, and some of you are wondering, well, how do you attach this to your lens? Um, and you can, actually, some shooters just don't attach it to the lens. They literally hold it in front of the lens and go up and down. Um, what I do is I have a filter holder that holds the filter. And this thing screws into the lens with an adapter ring. And I'll show you what that looks like when it's assembled. So this is a Canon camera. And uh, you can see that this thing has a slot. And you can move your, you know, you set your picture up. And you can move your grad up and down. So it is basically sitting over the sky. Um, and this is, you know, um, very easy to use. Um, and works like super well, okay? And uh, I'll show you some pictures I've taken using this technique. Um, these are all pictures I've taken, you know, they, they work great over water. Um, and one reason they work great over water is that, you know, the horizon line's flat, so it's easy to line it up. Using a grad filter when you've got, you know, a mountainous area that's all jagged is a little more complicated. But again, the balance of sky in this picture, this is taken at Katie, I used a grad filter. Same thing with this moon. Uh, this is shot uh, California and Big Sur. Uh, I used the a grad filter again in the shot um, in Acadia. And uh, I have, uh, I'm going to stop there. Now, um, this is a picture for our more advanced shooters. You're like noticing, hey, Tom, uh, you got that really beautiful ribbony sort of um, ethereal water in the front of the picture, how are you able to get a long exposure like that? Because you're shooting into the sun. This is a picture where I used actually two filters, okay? The first thing I do is I put that, uh, I'm going back, you'll notice that this filter holder has two slots. It'll actually hold more than one filter. So what I did for this shot is I first put a grad filter in to take care of the sky so it's balanced with the foreground. And then I took a, just a solid grad filter where the whole filter's darker. I took a six stop grad and I slid it basically in front of uh, the grad filter. And that allowed me to have a nice long exposure. Okay, so the grad filter allows you um, to cover the sky. And then, and I apologize, I used the wrong term. The neutral density filter where the whole filter is dark allows you to take a longer exposure, okay? And for those of you that are not familiar with some more uh, complicated techniques I'm going to talk about in Photoshop, grad filters are still a wonderful tool to use. Okay. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Any questions? Um, I'm going to hold. There is one question, but I'm going to hold it for a little bit later. So. Okay. Um, now, some of you may be wondering. Excuse me, uh, you know, which grad filters to get and how expensive they are and where I should get them. And I have links and advice for you in the notes, but I will give you some simple examples uh, or ideas of how to get started. The long and the short of it is to get a, uh, a good filter set, and that will basically include a filter holder, a couple of filter rings, so you can use this with a couple of lenses. And I would say, three filters, meaning a two, three stop grad and a uh, six stop 
neutral density filter to get all that stuff, you're probably looking at between four and 500 bucks. Um, it is not inexpensive. It's not terrible, but it's not inexpensive. Um, if you're a shooter that does a lot of stuff at water, uh, you might want to uh, think uh, seriously about it. Uh, in terms of which filters to get, um, I would stay away from Koken. They're cheap, they're inexpensive, and you'll eventually get color cast and you get rid of them and that's money wasted. I wouldn't do that. Um, the sort of uh, Cadillac of filters is Lee. Lee make great filters. Um, and there's some other, uh, there's one, uh, another type of filter I mentioned in my notes that I like a lot. Uh, also, and in terms of buying the filter holders, <clears throat> there's a guy called the filter guy that does knock off of Lee filter holders for half the price. So if you're, if you're interested in this, feel free to email me later, or you can take a look at the notes. That's just a little bit of information. And in terms of buying the filters, um, everybody sells them, B&H sells them. There's also a actual dedicated filter site that I've given you uh, when the people there are wonderful and give you great advice. And if you, you know, they specialize, all they do is filters. So I've given you some good information there. Okay, so everybody with that one exception of that one question we'll get to, I'm gonna jump into the next uh, technique we use. And this is more advanced. This is for advanced shooters. This requires you to have a knowledge of Photoshop and masking techniques in Photoshop, okay? And this is a technique called uh, exposure blending. So let me give you an example. So let's say I'm taking this picture here. <clears throat> and what I would do is I would take the first shot I would expose for the sky, okay? And uh, the next shot I will expose for the foreground, two different exposures. What I'm typically changing in these exposures um, but not always, I typically leave the aperture alone so I don't sort of have depth of field issues and I basically change the shutter speed, okay? And then what I will do is I will take these things into Photoshop and I will combine using masking techniques the sky with the foreground and I mix them together, okay? Now, if you're an advanced photographer and you're familiar with Photoshop, you know immediately what I'm talking about. Now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna get creative here and tell you some amazing stuff you can do in Photoshop. So um, normally speaking, when I'm sitting and I'm uh, Katie and I've got, I, I've mapped out my perfect spot and I may only have five minutes where the sky is perfect, okay? So I don't have a whole lot of time to worry about, you know, waves crashing and blowing up and getting the perfect spot. So it, it's money time. I got to get the sky right. So what I'll do is I may take six, seven shots of the sky. All I'm concerned about is the sky. And once I've got my sky, again, I'm on a tripod, I'm done. I, I've got a perfect sky. I don't have to worry about it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that perfect wave crash. If you ever shot, you know, ocean, you're looking for that every fourth or fifth wave where that, you know, that wave hits that rock and explodes into this, you know, cascading water shooting into the area. It can take you 10 minutes to get that perfect shot. I don't care. I'm going to be, I'm going to do a composite shot. So I'll wait and I'll do another five shots of that exploding wave. Okay. Now I'm not done yet. Now there's that, maybe I've got these beautiful rocks along the beach. All right. And I want to get that ethereal kind of uh, glowy, cloudy water on the beach, okay? So I'm gonna take another five shots and all I care about there is the area along the beach, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna pick my favorite sky shot, my favorite exploding water shot, and my favorite beach shot. And I take these into Photoshop and I create this amazing composite. And let me tell you something, before you could do this blending in Photoshop, you couldn't do this. You can't, you can't do that kind of, you know, that kind of complexity with a grad filter. It's just, you can't do it. So uh, eventually I, you know, I still use grads sometimes, but um, if I really, if I got a really important shot and I want it to be just right, a lot of times I'll use exposure blend. Okay. And I, and I, and if you're not familiar with Photoshop, no problem. There will come a time when you're ready to dive in 
And um, there's lots of good online courses and you'll love it. Don't worry. Um, everybody started not knowing Photoshop and me too. So anyway, um, any questions so far? Are we uh, still good? We're still good. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're nearing our, uh, we're about 90% done. So I'm taking into the final stretch. Okay. Um, now we're gonna talk about HDR software. <clears throat> um, this picture was taken many years ago, actually when I was shooting with a Canon 6D and I only had 11 and a half shots of dynamic range. I couldn't capture it in one shot. If I was shooting today with my Sony, I'd be able to capture it in one shot. So what I did is I did a, a three bracket shot. The first shot was two stops under the, uh, what is properly exposed. And you can see the sky looks fantastic. This is properly exposed. Now the sky is a little overcooked and the foreground, you can just start seeing it, but it's not perfect. And this shot is uh, two stops overexposed. And of course we've completely lost the sky, but the foreground is looking really good. So this is probably, I think in six, seven years ago, this is right when HDR software first came out. So I wanna show you what this looks like in different programs. So losing one of the early versions of Photomatix, which is one of the first HDR software programs, I combine these pictures and this looks a heck of a lot better, okay? Um, you know, we're able to get the sky, the foreground, you know, looking much better. Um, after that, a new program came out called HDR Exposed, which I thought, a lot of people thought was more realistic and more vibrant without looking like a science experiment. Photomatix in its early days, when you began to push the results, it started to look like somebody was playing in a uh, science room. It, it just didn't look real. So this is the same picture exposed with the HDR Exposed program. And then uh, Troy Radcliffe and the guys at Aurora came up with Aurora HDR, which looked very similar. And I liked because it was just a little easier to use, okay? Now I will say today, if you looked at the newest version of Photomatix, Aurora and HDR, they're all, they're all the same. They're very close. I would say Aurora HDR and, uh, uh, and uh, Photomatix are both really wonderful programs. However, we've forgotten one important option. Uh, Lightroom does um, actually HDR also, okay? So I wanna show you a picture I did. Now, when you, when you go into Lightroom, it's easy, you know, you go into the photo section, it allows you to combine pictures. And when I combine them, it asks me if I wanna uh, adjust the colors or make modifications. And I say, no, don't do it, don't touch it, just say negative. Now this is the picture combined in Lightroom. And I know what you're thinking, they're like, I mean, Tom, this looks kind of boring. I mean, it looks a little washed out, I don't like it. Oh, well, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not done yet, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this picture and I'm gonna add a little clarity, a little black point, a little denoise, I'm gonna do just a couple of really simple adjustments and bingo. Vibrance, black point, dehaze. This is the best picture of any of them as far as I'm concerned. It's the most realistic and this is the best. And I'll tell you why I think that Lightroom is the best HDR right now. Um, same thing, Photoshop, you can do this in Photoshop. When you take a picture and you put it in Photomatix Aurora, it's leaving Lightroom. It's a, you're taking a raw file. When it comes back, it's a TIFF. And hey, TIFFs are better than JPEG, but I, you know, my philosophy is I always want to work on a raw image if I can. You know, for example, when I go in, you get the same problem with Photoshop. You know, I try to do all my post-production work in Lightroom, take it into Photoshop. Once it comes back as a TIFF, there's less dynamic range, there's less stuff you can work with. I don't like to do a ton of work on a TIFF file. The beautiful thing about doing your HDR in Lightroom is it never leaves. It stays as a raw image and it allows you to drill down and really work on those parts of the picture, okay? So doing HDR in Lightroom is awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, um, any questions about that so far? Not about this, but the questions are stacking up. Oh, um, do, you a, wanna, do you wanna jump into those or wait? 
Why don't we wait? Because we'll, uh, they're not really on the topic you're on, so we can okay. wait. Um, now, um, I want to show you, I want to push some of the limits of HDR. I want to show you, um, you probably recognize this is uh, Antelope Canyon and wonderful place. And this is, you know, this is a nice picture. It's like everybody else's picture. Um, thousands of people to go there and they, you know, you take the same old picture, which is great. And not that I decided uh, I wanted to do something different. Uh, I wanted to uh, capture not just what was going on inside the canyon, but the interrelationship of the canyon to the sky above, which creates all the light. And I realized the dynamic range to do this picture would be probably 23 stops, nuts. So I went in and I did basically this is, um, uh, let's see, I went six stops under, four stops under, two stops under, properly exposed, two over, you know. So I took like six shots, okay? And then I combined them to this. So, you know, HDR does give you the chance to create images that you can only dream of before. And this is, this is an example of a picture that I'm, you know, I'm getting extreme dynamic range. In fact, this is a picture, I couldn't even see this when I was in there. I just had a feeling I could get it. So this is, um, and actually um, to put a plug in, I just, I published the books recently and this is the cover. So I'm glad I took this picture. Um, so, and finally, um, this is a picture at the Grand Canyon. And a lot of people ask me, hey, Tom, you know, you obviously work with HDR, you do exposure blending in Photoshop. What do you like better? Well, um, HDR in Lightroom is very easy. And a lot of times I'll try and see, you know, uh, if I can get what I'm looking for there. This is a real complicated picture where the sky was so bright. And when I'm dealing with super bright skies and a really dark foreground, I've had a little bit better luck doing exposure blending. Most of my friends that are pros um, that shoot, not everybody, I'd say we, I'd say 80% of us tend to use exposure blending when you got those crazy, you know, bright, uh, crazy sunset and sunrises. Um, you may say, well, what's wrong with using HDR? It just, it, it, it looks a little different, doesn't look quite as realistic. You can still get some really good results. And, and my answer to you is you really just got to play with it and see what you're more comfortable with and what works for you. And uh, that concludes uh, the, uh, the, my, my presentation. Before we get into questions, just a couple of quick things. Um, if you want to uh, see my website and uh, see my work, um, snitzerphotography.com, um, I invite you to do it. Um, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for free. Uh, I, have a, uh, I have a newsletter. I probably send it out maybe four times a year when I go on an interesting trip and I talk about interesting places I've gone, uh, share imagery, help you decide if this is a place you wanna visit. Um, so if you, if you like what you saw tonight and wanna to get to know my work a little bit better, I also have a blog in there where I drill down and talk about you know, places and places to go, places not to go. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, I invite you to do that. And that's fun because I probably post three or four times a week and talk about something I'm doing uh, helps you look at, you know, maybe how I compose the picture. I'm able to drill down a little bit more on an, individual pic on an individual picture basis. And tonight, if you have questions and you want to get a hold of me, I put my uh, email address and I'm happy, you know, feel free to email me. Uh, and that's great. So thank you. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions. And if, by the way, if you want to unmute people and people want to talk back and forth, whatever you guys feel comfortable with, I'm good. Yeah. So. Um so I'm going to get you to take your screen down. Um, and yes. while we're talking about this piece of it, you mentioned something about a book published. Tell me about that. Tell us about it. what is that? Because um, I'm being nosy now. Go ahead, plug oh. it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I have published a, uh, a book, uh, and I haven't decided. I'm right now. I'm just. Uh, uh, I have given it to a group of people that follow my work in some local bookstores. Um, whether I uh, end up offering it online uh, remains to be seen. So I probably should have kept my big mouth shut till I was ready to give you some online ordering, but uh, well, I've so had a lot of fun with it. Well, so we'll, um, we'll sign up for your newsletter and maybe we'll, we'll find out when that happens. I will, I will actually stay in touch with you about that. Thank you. 
yeah, that would be great. Okay, so let me hit you with a few questions. Um, trying to figure, remember who this is from. I think it's a Jidia's question is, it goes to um, bracketing. Um, do you have any recommendations of whether you use three, five, seven or more brackets? Because that last Antelope Canyon, I think you said you had, I think you mentioned like six. So do you have a number that you feel comfortable with? Sure, um, well, there's a, there's a couple things. Um, I bracket in different situations and keep in mind that I'm giving you this is, uh, you know, if you talk to five different people that shoot professionally, you're going to get five different answers. So this is very sort of a personal thing. I normally don't bracket when I'm just out shooting normally. That's because I, um, I guess I'm a little overly uh, confident. I mean, I, I, I feel like under normal situations, I know what I'm doing and I, I can nail the shot. A lot of my students will, when they're shooting, will bracket, they'll take three shots, one over and one under. Um, and you can't go wrong. You know, if you got a good memory card, why not do that? It just gives you a little extra room. Um, and that's a good, um, for somebody that's an advanced amateur or that's just trying some new stuff, um, that's not a bad idea. You know, that way you're just, and in fact, some pros do that. So for your everyday shooting, just one stop over, one stop under, okay? Um, when I'm shooting like a really complicated sunrise or a sunset, then I would recommend shooting, you know, three shots, one stop under, one stop over. Again, you're still doing everything in manual, but it's just giving you a little extra latitude. In terms of when I'm going crazy, um, I don't normally like we'll do a five or a seven, uh, you know, bracket picture, except, except when I'm in like a very unusual situation where I want to get everything. And those are like 1% of my picture. So it's, it's highly unusual but I do more than a three uh, bracket shot. <clears throat> okay. Um, Gary's asking, when you expose your blend, do you use a brush to paint on the mask, a gradient to apply the mask or blend it to merge the layers? Right. Um, there are lots of uh, techniques that people use. Um, here's basically, um, here's a good way to do it if you're, you're just, cutting your teeth and exposure blending. What I basically do is I will uh, basically go into Lightroom and I will export um, my images, which, which are, you know, just let's for, keep it simple, two images. I got a light image for the sky and a darker image for the foreground. I will uh, export those as layers into Photoshop, okay? And then what I'll do is I'll create a layer mask. So let's say for the top picture and I'll use a, a brush with a soft brush so it's nice uh, and soft. And I'll, I'll use the mask and I'll just brush in one picture after the other. And as you know, when you're working on a layer mask, you're either brushing in white or black. So you can brush something in, you don't like it, you change it to the other the opposite color and you can brush it out. And so you can play with that. And I use a, usually use a brush tool or a gradient tool um, when I'm just starting off. Um, when you get into more technical, um, you know, Tony Cooper has a bunch of different sort of uh, masking tools you can use that are color mask or luminosity mask. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing something where I really got to drill down and get every little thing, I'll use a bunch of complicated luminosity masks. But you know what? 90% of the time I'm using a brush and it just works out great and no one can tell the difference between that. And I'm, I'm a lazy. I mean, like easy peasy, man. I'm, 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 the other thing I'll tell you, like, Especially, um, I'm digressing, but one of the things that I found, especially if you're a sports photographer, corporate, um, if you're on an assignment and you've got to get the stuff like to the Tribune or something quickly, you relish the ability to move quickly. I'm not like, I'm not looking to spend all day long messing around with a picture. So, um, you know, when people ask me, what do you do? If simple works, you go as simple. Okay. Um, Angie's gonna, Angie's question is gonna build on this mm -hmm. one. She wants to know, are you also focus stacking when you're doing the exposure blending? That is a, uh, actually a wonderful question. And um, actually, um, matter of fact, I'm gonna give you an example because I, I love that you asked this because this, if I'm going out with very advanced students, when you're, um, when you're taking multiple pictures, you can do different types of stack at the same time, okay? So I'm going to talk about that exact um, scenario. So um, I don't have the picture up right now, but 
let's pretend you're in a field of wildflowers and there's this beautiful um, sunset behind you, but your wildflowers are in shade, which is good because you're getting all the saturation, but you've got, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously you're gonna to need to do one picture for the uh, sky and you're gonna to need to do a picture for the wildflowers. But you're gonna, I, when I take wildflowers, sometimes I get down, I'm like five inches off the ground and I'm like within inches of the wildflowers. I want them to look big. So I've got to do focus stacking, right? So here's my workflow for this image. And this is, I actually did this like last week. So I'm sitting there, I'm going, okay. Um, oh, by the way, just to make it even more complicated, it's a little windy out. So I'm trying to focus stack these flowers and they're moving. And, I, and I've got to have a, a fast enough shutter speed so they don't blur. So this is what I do. I'm gonna take four shots to focus stack the foreground, okay? For this flowers, not worried about the sky yet. I'm on my tripod, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my ISO up to like a thousand because I'm not worried about dynamic range. This is all the shade, who cares? What I wanna do is I'm turning up my ISO because I don't want these flowers to be blurred. So I'm gonna, my first four shots, I'm gonna you know, maybe focus at three inches then I'm gonna focus at maybe 18 inches. I'm going geometrically further back in the image and the next one's three feet. Now I'm focusing maybe 10 feet. And I'm shooting, by the way, when I'm focus stacking, I'm probably at F16. Now you're, you're probably wondering, oh my God, you know, that, that's not your sharpest focal length. But when I'm focus stacking, I'm, what, I'm, what I really want is I wanna combine, um, I wanna combine these images as seamlessly as possible. And I wanna not have depth of field issues. Okay, so I focus stacked at an ISO of a thousand. Now it's time for me to take my final shot of the sky. Okay, now I'm worried about uh, dynamic range here because that's super bright and there's areas of the, that sky that are dark because there are clouds and areas that are bright in the sun. So I'm gonna turn my ISO all the way down to hundred again. And that last shot, I'm gonna redial everything in. So what I'm doing is I'm doing ISO stacking, focus stacking, and I'm doing basically image blending all in one shot with five shots. And, and by the way, this, if this sounds complicated, the great thing is you play with this and it's easy. It's really not difficult. You just experiment. Okay. Um, Gary's asking, <coughs> what is the advantage to using a, a grad ND filter over a digital filter in Lightroom? Uh, sure. Um, I wanna think carefully about how I answer this. Okay, if, if you, all right, from a matter of a physics point of view, when you take a picture, basically, if, if, the, if you look at the histogram and you're inside the, uh, the uprights of the, you know, the goalpost, there's no advantage at all. I mean, you know, you, I could get in a real esoteric argument with somebody about, well, you know, on the dark images, you're getting a little more noise, but by and large, if you can, you know, if you don't have tremendous amount of dynamic range, as long as your picture is in the goalpost, you can achieve the same results using a digital filter. Where you really need to use a grad filter or a, a physical filter is when the dynamic range is so great, you can't get it. And, you know, when you have a really bright sunrise or sunset, you're going to have a, a really tricky time getting it in one picture without a grad filter. Um, it's just, it's just too much. Okay. Um, ben wants to know the Antelope Canyon shot. Was that an HDR or was, an expo was it an exposure blended image? Um, the one where I took this five shots, mm -hmm. that was HDR. Okay. Uh, and okay. that kind of picture, you really, it's hard to get that kind of image without HDR. The thing that one of the reasons it worked out so well um, is that we didn't have a lot of these complicated red tones in the sky. And, you know, I do with HDR with bright skies that are blue and aren't complicated and aren't sunrises and sunsets, I have a lot of uh, success with HDR. Same thing if I'm shooting indoors. You know, I've done some assignments where I'm trying to shoot the indoor uh, of somebody's home and I'm trying to, you know, get the windows dialed in with the interior lighting. Uh, I, I, get, I get really good results with HDR there. Okay, I think this will be the last question that I'm, and there was a lot of comments and I'm gonna share the, the chat with you so that 
that you can see it. But Todd's question is, any special advice for astrophotography, especially in the Milky Way? Um, yeah, I actually, I teach a whole course, <laughs> I have a whole Zoom course in astrophotography and on my website, no, you can see really? it. So, hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm like super duper, uh, okay, um, wow. That's a that's a, like an hour discussion. I'll give you the real basics. How's that? Okay, give us give us your top tips, and maybe okay. I can persuade you to come teach that class. Okay. Um, okay. The first thing is um, when you're shooting the Milky Way or at night, um, you don't want a big moon ruining everything, and you obviously you don't want a bunch of clouds in the sky where you can't see everything. So there's usually about five days a month around the new moon. Um, where you can shoot, okay? So uh, in terms of when to shoot, um, you're, you're shooting around the new moon, okay? On either side of it. Um, so the next thing to do is you wanna go someplace where there's not a lot of light pollution and there's, um, there are uh, programs or applications you can use that help you look at like how far do I have to drive away from a city where the, till the light pollution disappears. So number one, shoot during that five, six day window. Number two, stay away from light pollution. Um, uh, number three, um, you're gonna be shooting with a wide angle lens typically um, and a, a fast lens because you wanna get as much light in the lens. And um, typically, you know, basically anywhere from 14 millimeters on to I'd say like, you know, 30, 30 millimeters, 32 millimeters, you get much bigger than that. And what you're trying to do is like, basically when you're shooting stars, the stars are rotating around the North Star. It's like a big wheel of fortune going around. And so um, there are rules of thumb, um, but basically if you're shooting with a wider angle lens, you have more time before you start getting blurring in the, in the stars, okay? So, you know, basically my, my basic go-to if I'm teaching students is we'll get out there with a 14 millimeter lens F2.8 um, and I, you know, I can talk about how lens choice and stuff, but you want a fast lens. And if you're at F4, if you're at, um, you know, 14 millimeters, you can keep that lens open for a good 25 seconds. You know, if you go to like 30 millimeters, you only got like 11 or 12 seconds. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be sort of playing with the ISO, you know, so to get the stars right. So my sort of go-to settings would be, you know, at like a 14 millimeter F2.8, I'd probably go 25 seconds and I'm probably shooting at an ISO of maybe 6,000 on a typical night. Um, and then, then there's a whole thing with noise. So um, and I'm gonna do this kind of quickly because I, I, that's a whole other thing. Um, I do, there's another type of stacking called noise stacking. And it allows you, if you, you shoot a series of images and by combining them, you eliminate noise. I don't mean reduce noise. I mean, you eliminate noise. So um, there's workflows I can teach you where you're shooting stars with no noise. And there's programs that we use that allow you um, to separate the foreground and the stars because the stars are rotating and the foreground's not. Um, there's a program called Starry Landscape Stacker. So if you look at my images, the Milky Way looks like crystal clear. That's how I get that. And then the other part of shooting at night is how you light up foreground. I like I don't just want to shoot the Milky Way. I want to shoot mountains in front of it, uh, buildings in front of it, rocks in front of it. And so I either use combination of LED, low light LED panels that are gelled, like I can adjust the color temperature, um, or I'll use the moon. And actually. Um, a crescent moon that's like six, seven, eight um, percent. I have pictures where I've lit the whole moon is lit by uh, the whole mountain range is lit by the moon. So I have these like dramatic shots where you can see like the Grand Canyon with the Milky Way shooting out of it, and that's done by using the moon. So um, I just blown through about an hour full of crap, but um, that's some of the some of the techniques I use, and I, I love astrophotography. Um. We're sneaking into more questions. So Angie is asking, um, is what you're talking about now, or is is she's heard it when people talk about shooting a um, a bias frame or in dark frames to reduce noise? Is that kind of the technique you're you're, you're referring to? Sure. Okay. Um, many cameras are set up where you can shoot a dark frame, 
to quote, reduce noise. And a lot of it is like when you've got a hot sensor, if you have a really long exposure, um, the sensor can get hot and you can get these like hot pixels that are red and stuff. Um, most astrophotographers, and, and honestly, I, there's, there's a couple of guys that have been my mentors, um, one of whom is like Wayne Pinkston's one of them, um, who's like, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen Wayne's stuff. Yep. Um, you know, I, I remember, go, I mean, Wayne's like the guru, he really taught me most of this, but um, Wayne, most really good astrophotographers don't worry about that stuff. Um, we're all either focused, most of us are noise stacking, and that's what Wayne normally does. There's some people that actually have these um, star tracking devices that track the stars. Um, and, and I, um, those are great and they work terrific. I just think they're a, a gigantic pain in the ass. <laughs> so- um, That's a more thing to carry with you. Yeah, the, and by the way, noise stacking is a technique that you can use. Um, and I get, 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 I got, you know, I wish you know, I could go on for a long time, but like you walk in a, okay, you walk into a church, you forgot your tripod, this is an amazing church. You got to turn the ISO up to 10,800 and it's going to be noisy as hell. Oh my God, you know, I'm in the, this incredible church, what do I do? Well, what you do is you hold the, you hold the camera, hand hold it, you bang off 13 pictures, you take them into Photoshop and very quickly you eliminate all the noise by stacking these. And uh, that's for another day explaining how noise stacking works, but it is an incredible tool. Okay, we're gonna sneak in one more for you, David. How can you focus a night with a lens that does not autofocus? Do you right. trust the infinity setting? That is a, uh, a very good question. Um, I'm thinking, okay. Uh, I'm gonna go easy peasy and then I'm gonna go like complicated. Easy peasy is um, if you, like if you're shooting with a, like a mirrorless camera, like a Sony, um, you have basically, when you, when you rotate the focus ring in manual focus, you can see where infinity shows up on the dial. So what I do is I turn it to infinity, then I back it off to about 20 meters. Okay, and the reason is um, lenses, um, th this, there, there's a concept called hyperfocal distance and I don't wanna, uh, if you're not familiar, people aren't familiar with it, but basically there's a spot inside uh, infinity focus where you get more in focus. You get infinity and you get stuff on the inside. So I will focus, basically about 20 to 40, you know, feet or yards out. And that's the sweet spot. And I can do that in a mirrorless camera because I can just look in the, the, uh, the viewfinder. Now, some of you are saying, well, I don't have a mirrorless camera. What do I do? Well, one of the things I'll do is I'll take a flashlight and I can shine it on, a, you know, a, a distant piece of ground that's 20 feet away or 40 feet away. And I'll manually focus on that. Or a number of people will during the day, um, will basically take their lens and focus on something 60 feet away. And they'll, they'll take a magic marker and make a little uh, mark on the focus ring and the, the part of the lens right before it. And when they come out at night, they just line those up. All those work perfectly well to focus. Now, complicated. Um, whoops, I just took my, uh, excuse me, I just took my uh, headphones out. Let me start over. Okay, there, there are times when I'm shooting at night when I need to focus on something that's very close to me and at, at the Milky Way, so I'm focus stacking at night. So uh, an example of that is I just did a picture with a buddy of mine. We were at a place called Racetrack, which you may have heard at in Death Valley where these rocks appear to move at night. So like a bunch of idiots were out there at two in the morning. Uh, and by the way, uh, there, there, are app, I, there are also apps that tell you when the Milky Way is gonna be where in the sky. So you're not wandering around at night wondering when it's gonna come out. So we wanted to get pictures of these rocks that are close to us and then the Milky Way. So the way we would do it is we basically got LED panels. We focused on the rocks. We, just, we did basically 10 shots of the rocks for our first, you know, to basically create a stack of close in. Then we did a stack of the Milky Way and then we combined them. And so I have a shot that I have on my website of racetrack and that's how that shot was taken. That's the complicated way. Okay. That I think is the last question I had for you. 
I'm going to say thank you so much for coming and breaking down HDR for us. It was a lot of information. I knew a lot of it, but there were a couple of things that I thought, well, wait a minute, I've never even thought about this. So I'm going to have to go back and look at your notes <laughs> for my own education. So Tom, thank you so much for coming in and, and, and doing this. Um, it, it's it's going to be a great addition to the, the Happiness Hour um, YouTube channel, and I, I truly appreciate it. Um, right. Let me ask you real quick. Um, where, let me. Um, where can they sign up for your newsletter? Someone uh, put in the chat that they were on your website and they were, didn't see it. Is it? Is it? Um, there should be a pop up if you have your pop up blocker turned on. Okay. You should be able to do it. Um, okay. If for some reason you turn off your pop block, your pop up blocker, and you still uh, can't do it. Just have them email me, okay. and I'll 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 be happy to put you on manually. Okay, perfect. All right, guys, um, you can connect with Tom at snitzerphotography.com, and if you're on Instagram, look for him at Snitzer Photography. Next week, Ernesto Harris will be here to talk about his philosophy and ideas behind the slow photography movement. Until next time, go out create something beautiful and hope that we see you again soon.